Oh, I hope after this presentation, some of you at least have some ideas of how to lead with different cases as we face when we're uh, researching vulnerabilities. This presentation is mainly focused around web vulnerabilities. You may think it's too much like, I don't know, uh, bug bounty focus, but it does extend, for example, if you're just researching uh, another, for example, open source uh, web projects uh, in which you deal with web applications and all of that. So I do hope you walk out with some ideas to maybe try out the next time you're researching some of this. Also, what to feel or what not to feel uh, when you fail at what you're trying to do. And a, a little bit about the legal part that we may not think too much when we're researching these types of stuff, but it is important to keep in mind. Okay, so starting with the cliche first, who am I? Why should you be hearing to me? Um, I'm an upside researcher at Checkmarks. I've been here for three years. Uh, my focus is on web vulnerability research. That's mainly my focus out of work. I really enjoy just hacking websites, uh, doing bug bounties, doing research on uh, open source applications, anything related to web. I may not have like uh, green hair. I may not have 20 years in security like some people that have presented before. Uh, you could say I've been interested in security since, I don't know, I was 12 maybe. Uh, I think some of you can relate with just installing Kali on your computer, dual booting it, then fucking up the computer and have to just install everything again. Well, that's pretty much my path for like the last 12 years, 13 years, until I joined Checkmarks and started getting a little bit more into the actual security part and the research. So. I am someone that actually went through this, I'd say, path uh, quite recently. So I hope I can share some of my learnings here. Okay, what is vulnerability research? Uh, I won't really get too much into the uh, definition. I think most people can gather what vulnerability research is just by the name, uh, but it's nothing more than the process of finding, understanding, are exploiting vulnerabilities in software or hardware. And for this, a lot of people like to do it in a lot of different ways. Some people like using tools to help them, for example, SAS and DEST. Some people just like doing manual code reviews. So a lot of people just like focusing on open source projects or in bug bounty programs where they actually provide you some source code. Uh, some people like doing reverse engineering, uh, maybe binaries, maybe mobile applications. Some, some people just like fuzzing everything, just set up 20 different fuzzers, just let them run for a week, see if you find something. Uh, point is you have a thousand different ways to do vulnerability research, just pick your poison, you're going to be at it for a long time. So who actually does vulnerability research? Um, I, you, you have a lot of intelligence agencies doing this. I have a couple of examples, but they are far from the only ones doing this kind of stuff. Uh, remember Eternal Blue from like 10 years ago, I think, maybe, maybe more. That was because the NSA just liked doing vulnerability research and just keeping all of their findings to them. So they just research a bunch of software. In this case, it was a, SMB vulnerability for Windows, which granted them a uh, full RC in any system at the time. And it got leaked. They, another group hacked into the N N NSA and just leaked everything to the public. So along with Eternal Blue, a whole lot of other hacking tools and exploits from the NSA that they were just hoarding for themselves got leaked. And that was a whole mess. Uh, Wanna Cry was from Eternal Blue as well. But yeah, point is a lot of people do vulnerability research. Uh, you don't have just like uh, nation states, you also have a lot of individuals. You have people hacking for financial incentives. You have, for example, a lot of bug bounty platforms. They got a really popular in the last 10 years. Have platforms like HackerOne, Bugground, Integrity. You have zero day exploit acquisition platforms. So 
you could try just, okay, I found a zero click RC on an Apple device. Great. I can report it to Apple for a million dollars or I can sell it to Zerodium for three million. Um, you have the, I don't know, the moral and ethical questions about just selling exploits on the gray market and who might buy them and where they might use them. But some people like to, no, some people don't care about that stuff. You have, for example, academia. A lot of novel research techniques come out of academia as well. Uh, in the last few years, you have, you had a lot of research on side channel attacks coming out of academia. You, you've been seeing a lot of research as well on LLM security as well coming from academia, uh, in the last, in the last year. And you just have people who hack for recognition and fun. I, I insert more in the, in the last group. So what's the, what's the path here to actually progress from just knowing the theory to actually know it, to actually doing and to actually go into the, the practice part here? When we start getting into the whole, uh, security field, especially if we're like want to just get our hands in it, get dirty, we just start seeing a lot of different terms. So we start seeing all of these different acronyms like XSS, SQLi, all of this like WAFs. Uh, maybe we see terms like responsible disclosure. We start seeing all different filters that there are, uh, limitations, CSPs, etc., etc. We just have a flood of information that we just have to keep up with. And we just have to learn to actually be able to just do anything or even do nothing. Maybe we just learn all of this and we practice it for a year and we find nothing. That's also pretty possible. Uh, but the most important point here is actually the continuous learning, which is just this isn't the field where you can stagnate. Uh, wherever you learn today may not be relevant, uh, still tomorrow. So it's just something that we have to keep, uh, keep on top of. We have to actually keep learning and just keep updating our knowledge, even if we're already really experienced in the field. Okay. Uh, I do hope here that I can share with you a couple of examples that will help me exemplify this. Uh, transition and some of the, the stuff that I hope you, you can learn and take away from, from this. My first example is a self XSS, which I found. These are real vulnerabilities in real websites that I have found in the last couple of months. And the other one is a CSTI turn to reflected XSS. Okay. So starting with our self XSS, like almost everything, we, we have a search box. So, we just start writing our inputs in the search box and we see that the input is actually getting reflected down here. So what's the first thought going through our mind? Just let's just try a basic XSS payload. So we input it there, but nothing happens. So we start thinking, okay, that's kind of weird. Um, why should this, why should this be happening? Um, let's check the source. When we start looking through the source, it's a bit of a confusing uh, application, but we eventually find it and we can see that in this case, the, um, we, if we search for the keywords, we can find this piece of code. And here we can see that it's going through an inner HTML. And here I started thinking, okay, maybe this inner HTML actually had something to do with why this is not working. So let's research it. Um, when we start researching, we can go, for example, to Stack Overflow, we can go to Reddit, but I like starting a bit more simple. I like going back to the basics a bit, and I like going to the spec, so in this case, the HTML spec, and see if there is anything to say about this case there. And here, we actually do have uh, something to say about it, so what the HTML spec says is that if we try to use the script element in the page, uh, like if we try to insert it using a document.write, it will execute, usually. But if we try to put it with an inner HTML or an outer HTML uh, attribute, then it, they won't execute at all. So in this case, since we are using an inner HTML, our script payload is not working. Okay, great. 
that's no problem. We have like an infinite amount of XSS payloads we can try. So let's see the image payload. That's actually my favorite XSS payload. You can just test for a lot of different stuff with it all at once. Maybe the website couldn't, maybe it wasn't vulnerable to XSS, but maybe it was vulnerable, for example, to HTML injection. It's a bit different. Uh, one is more, uh, has more impact than the other. You can just call XSS, for example, JavaScript injection, but you can still do a lot of HTML injection if you, even if you didn't have JavaScript execution. Uh, but okay, we put the, the image payload here. And when we're writing the payload, we actually have the broken tag there. So we can see that at least HTML injection is working here. But when we get to the end and we close our payload, when we close the tag, actually everything just disappears. And that was really weird because why well, it, it was working before. It just completely disappeared when I closed the tag. So I started investigating a bit uh, along this. And I came uh, to a concept that was strange to me. I didn't know about this concept. I knew about the like the behavior, but I didn't know about this term before, which was tag soup. And for those unfamiliar with it, like I was, it's pretty much just a name that's given to a concept about around HTML engines, which over time had to evolve because devs were writing a lot of shitty code which didn't have like correct HTML formatting. Either the HTML was malformed or misnested, just plain wrong HTML. And the engines over time had to evolve a bit to actually be able to show something to the end user that made sense instead of just showing like a mess in the, in the web page. So over time they evolved, but now we, this is actually something that we can use in our benefit. So, okay, we know that the engine itself can do some corrections to the HTML. So if the engine itself can do some corrections, let's examine the HTML. Let's see what, what is actually happening. Let's look at the source code of the page when we're writing the, the payloads there. So when we write the payload without closing it, we can see that actually the HTML is there. It's not, for example, it's not being encoded. There's no sanitization whatsoever, but it's like missing something. It's getting this strong tag being appended to it and it's just like not working. Okay. And then when we try to close the tag, it just completely disappears and just the, this text just ends up showing. Okay. But without closing the tag, the payload is actually all of the, all there. So let's try something more in this case. Okay. It's not shrinking. And what if we end the payload, not just open, like not just not closing the tag, but what if we also put uh, an HTML comment at the end? So we counteract this, uh, this strong, uh, closing tag that's being appended to our payload. Well, in this case, if we actually end our payload with an closing HTML comment, then we actually get uh, the XSS executing. Great. We finally get our so uh, coveted alert box, but unfortunately we couldn't ex escalate this anymore. We didn't have any CSRF. We didn't have any cache poisoning that we could make use of. There was no possibility of click checking and maybe you're just thinking, okay, so for all of this work, why didn't we just fuzz it with an XSS fuzzer? You have a lot of them online. Well, to that I say, especially when, when we're just starting out, when we're learning every little piece of manual testing uh, helps a lot. You could just 100% just throw an XSS fuzzer here and it would find it eventually. Um, no doubt about that. A lot of them just go through a playlist. You have a lot of them on GitHub and you can just see that a lot of them also try, for example, XSS mutations and just stuff with broken tags. So one of them would execute eventually. But if we did that, we wouldn't have learned about all of this stuff. We wouldn't have learned about... Um, all of the HTML, uh, all of the spec uh, minute details. So I wouldn't say it was a waste of time, even if we didn't accomplish what we came here to, to do. 
uh, we still learned a lot. Like we got a little bit more comfortable examining source code about the, the application. We read, read the HTML spec and we learned about TechSoup and maybe this didn't help us this time. Like we did, we did end up actually getting a self XSS, but that didn't, people don't really pay us or do anything for self XSS. They just said thank you. And that was it. And, but even if here it wasn't really of a great help, it will probably be of help in the next uh, time that we try to exploit something like this. And maybe next time, uh, our knowledge about TechSoup and the inner HTML will actually help us. Maybe it will net us a good vulnerability next time. Okay, but what about uh, an example a little bit more complex this time? Uh, once again, we start with a search box. Uh, I think that's maybe the one of the more cliche ways to start uh, web research. But in this case, we didn't have the our payload actually just in interpreting HTML right away. So actually what we found here was that if we put a template injection payload in there, it actually executed the, the expression. So in this case, if we try to put, for example, a seven times seven, it actually rendered as 49. So I just start thinking, okay, I, I hit the jackpot. Like, I know how nobody found this before, but I just, just found RC. I'm going to report this, get like a multi thousand dollar payout, whatever. Um, no, I, I, I can already spoil the fun. That didn't happen, unfortunately. Uh, it was not an SSTI, it was actually a CSTI. And if we just look at all of the ways that the application is loading code, we can see that it's using Angular. So we can look at the source code, we can look at the network tab, we can look at the... Um, uh, this is a, an extension, I think it's Webalizer. I really like using it. And don't be confused, like, it may seem small, this difference, it's just like one letter from CSTI to SSTI, but that's the difference between uh, just having, for example, an XSS, which is the main impact of CSTI, you can actually get it to execute arbitrary JavaScript, and SSTI, in which you can just get it, I'd say most of the time, to actually execute code on the machine, so two a whole different impacts, two different worlds here. But, okay, not, let's not just get sad. We, let's see how, how we could actually discern one from another, uh, more easily. The, this polyglot, which I use here, which is like a polyglot is just a whole bunch of things mashed together in which you try to pinpoint, uh, if an application is actually vulnerable to something or not. This specific polyglot is from, I think it's a Cobalt article. I really, really recommend if anyone is interested in SSTI, then go read, just search on Google about Cobalt. I think it's Cobalt Strike, SSTI, and you'll probably find it. And they have this polyglot in which you, you can try to put it in the page. And if it is vulnerable to SSTI, and it, then it will probably either like render an error or just do some funky rendering that they shouldn't be doing. In this case, it just, it was completely the same. So we didn't have anything there, but the, we, we didn't know that something was happening. So even though we didn't have an SSTI, most probably we had an CSTI. Another good way that I, I like to test for this difference, uh, especially in SSTI, is you can actually pinpoint the type of application. Imagine if the, uh, if the request didn't return any server headers or anything that could like identify the cookies didn't say like PHP session ID or anything that could like identify the application itself and you had a, a SSTI. Like you, how could you identify this? I have some examples and instead of using an expression like the seven times seven, we could just try to cause an error and the easiest way to cause an error is to divide by zero. In most languages, at least, if we try to divide by zero, we get like a verbose error message. So here, for example, it's Ruby. It's just saying that it's just Ruby 2.7, all of that. Here, 
I have an example in Python. This one is even more verbose because it tells us the Python version and the package that was being used. So in this case, it was Tornado that was being used to render the SSTI. And in this case, we have, for example, a Java example. This is FreeMaker. So we can get a lot of information from trying to uh, trying to get the, the application to our routes. Of course, you need to actually have output. Maybe you have a blind SSTI, so you wouldn't be able to actually pinpoint it by this, but in basic cases, uh, I really like doing this. So if we try to do this in our application, what do we get? We just get an infinity. And why do we get an infinity? Because JavaScript is fun. And I, I think a lot of people really like JavaScript. I have no doubt about that. And in JavaScript, when we try to divide by zero, all that we get is just an infinity. Great. So if it's JavaScript and it's like almost 100% sure that in this case, it's going to be the Angular CSTI. Okay, we know it's an Angular CSTI. We know the Angular version because Webalizer showed us and we could see it in the imports. Well, if we know all of this, and that should be easy to exploit, right? Uh, well, no. Uh, I think that's, you're going to see a pattern here. If it was easy, then it wouldn't be fun. And in this case, if we went looking for payloads on a CSTI for Angular 1.2.24, we get, for example, this simple thing that didn't work. Then we get this simple thing that also didn't work. So we were just starting to maybe wonder that, okay, maybe maybe this just doesn't work at all. Uh, but from looking a little bit more, we found like in the lost Twitter thread with like one like, we found this little payload here, which actually did work, actually did render an alert box. So, okay, we have uh, uh, JavaScript execution, I have an XSS, but let's try to do something a bit more with this. Let's try a little bit, let's, let's think a little bit bigger. So in this case, all that I'm trying to do is to actually get a callback just to see if I can actually reach my machine. So I'm trying to insert a script element and I'm using my burp collaboration link. But unfortunately, I get no callback, like, it, I just get no hits back, and when I go look at the console, there there isn't anything there. Like it's completely empty. There's no cars errors. There's no CSP errors. There isn't anything there. So what could be happening? Uh, maybe maybe the payload just didn't execute. Maybe we triggered a WAF. Maybe we hit a filter. So. In these cases, the first thing I like to do is actually trying to see if there's a bad character. So let's try to identify the problematic characters here. And in this specific case, all of these characters, if they were in the, in the actual payload, inside of the payload, then it will just uh, not execute. It would just live and not do anything, including a space. So yeah, it's a bit hard to see, but it's there. But we can think, okay, that's easy. Like we don't need all of these characters. I don't see any parentheses, any normal parentheses there. So we can just encode the whole payload in base64 and just evolve it, right? That, that would be an easy way to bypass it. But unfortunately, in this case, eval is actually being filtered out. So we actually do not uh, have the option to use eval here. So I just take a, a moment to stop and think, and I just try to weigh out the pros and cons of going at this alone. And I started thinking about just collaborating with a colleague of mine that I know also has some experience dealing with these types of of problems and these types of uh, of research. And we, and we decide to collaborate. I could have done this alone. Maybe I would have taken like twice the time, and in that time, maybe someone would report it before me. Maybe I wouldn't have taken twice the time, and I would do it at the same way, but why risk it? And also, I don't, I'm not of the opinion that just doing everything alone is the best way to do it. If you can learn from something, from something or someone else, I think that's also a really good way to, to learn, and a really big uh, way, really just easy way to learn with someone that also has experience in this. Um, so we start brainstorming in this case, and we come up with two, uh, 
I, I put here solutions, but it's more like two paths that we can follow. We can either use no bad characters and none of these functions that are being filtered out, or we can use no none of the bad characters and try to bypass the function filters. We, in this case, opted for the first one, no bad characters and functions, uh, because we thought that it was a little bit easier to do, like, quicker. So we know which characters we can't use, and we know that eval is being filtered. So uh, the first thing we have to do is find another way to eval code, and that's the easy part. We JavaScript has like a thousand different ways to just eval code, and in this case, uh, the two, at least the two ways that we just could think about on the, off the top of our heads was, for example, using constructor.constructor, .constructor, just uh, calling the constructor and it can take a, a string and pretty much just e creates a function out of it and evolves it. And you have some classes and some functions that can also just re receive text and execute it like a function. So, for example, set timeout, set interval function, but there's a lot of those there. We start testing this and like pretty much all of these functions were being filtered out. So set interval we couldn't use, uh, set timeout we also couldn't use, function, the function class we also couldn't use. So we just, okay, let's, let's just see the constructor the constructor and let's try that. But remember that the dot was one of the like bad characters that we had. So what we had to do here was to get a way to access this constructor like property another way and lucky for us in JavaScript everything is an object so if everything is an object then we could just use the like the square brackets to access the object properties and so let's try that and as you can see that works okay so the first part of our problem is solved we actually have a way to execute code we actually have a way to pass a string and that string is being evaluated as code in this case we actually need like this second set of parentheses at the end because the constructor constructor is actually like constructing a function out of your text. And if you want to execute it right away, you need this second set of parentheses to actually tell JavaScript to, hey, execute this right now. But okay, moving on. Now we can test our hypothesis. So we just encode our payload in base64. We put it here and let's see if it worked. Well, uh, it did work. So I don't have, actually I don't have a, an image here, but it did work. So we just pass uh, encode it and use the JavaScript function A to B to decode it. And that's all fine. And I, we start thinking this is a bit of a, I wouldn't say spoiler, but we just, this part we did at the end of when we already had done all of this, we went back and looked at the filter as well. And we were thinking how hard uh, would it have been to actually bypass this filter? And if there was actually a way to bypass a filter, sometimes that isn't. Uh, but in this case, it was pretty trivial. Uh, the, the filter wasn't uh, recursive. So if we just plop an eval inside another eval, the filter goes over it once, takes out the eval that it finds, and just leaves the other eval to actually work. So we actually didn't have to do all of this, but good to know. Okay, so we have reflected XSS and we have a way to actually pass some text and actually get evaluated so we don't have to worry about all of those bad characters. What can we do next? Uh, this application wasn't really too complex. Um, it was just a service. And so you didn't have, for example, ways to do, to execute a command to, through a cron job or anything like that. It, it wasn't like a management application, just a simple service. And we start thinking, okay, uh, the holy grail here is actually to get account takeover. So we, we want to actually take over the, the victim's account if they trigger our XSS. Okay, so we start thinking of ways that we can actually get this account takeover. So first thing, let's see if we can change the email. We can, we actually have, we just intercepted the request to change it and try to, to, to set it to another email, but the email field was like grayed out, but you could insert it in the request as well. And if you sent that, it would change it, but only in the front end. So if you try to log in into the application, it would actually still be using the, the previous email. If you try to reset the password, it was still using the previous email. So that was a no-go. We tried changing the password, but 
for that we needed the current password. So that didn't work. But one thing I do want to say about this is always test this functionality out. It wouldn't be the first nor the second time that we found an application that just didn't implement this functionality correctly and you could just send nothing in the current password field and it would actually change the password. Or you could just send, send like uh, garbage data in the password field, the current password, and it would accept it anyway. So always test it out. In this case, it was implemented correctly, so we actually did need the correct current password. And we couldn't grab the session cookie because that was actually HTTP only. So, uh, yeah, so we couldn't grab the, the value. So we start thinking, okay, maybe there isn't a way to actually do this. Maybe we'll just have to stay with our reflected XSS. But we're stubborn. And we start researching and we remember something that we read before and something that we actually encountered once before as well, which was, okay, maybe we can grab the value right out of the session cookie, but maybe the value of the session cookie is being reflected elsewhere in the application. So we just navigate all over the application, try to just crawl all over the, the website, and then we search for the value of the, of the cookie string. So uh, for this, we used a Bamda. You can do this a, a lot of different ways, but this was when Bamdas were a bit new and we really liked Bamdas. So what we did here is we just filtered for every response that was in scope and we just got for every response, we looked if it contained the value of the session cookie. And fortunately for us, we actually got two hits there. They were both the same page but they actually contained the value of the session cookie. So if we went there, there it is, just a hidden input field with the session ID in it. Okay, so that's fantastic. Let's try a, let's, let's then do a, a bigger payload and see if we, if it actually works to actually exfill this session, the session value. This payload is nothing more than just like, it's really simple. All we're doing is just fetching the URL that actually leaks the session value. For that, then we get the response to text. We initiate a parser. In this case, we're using the DOM, DOM parser uh, class. And then we just do a query selector and we filter it for inputs in which the name was session ID and we got the value. And then we just pass that on to another fetch to a URL that we controlled. Well, that would all be great. If things were that easy, they wouldn't be fun. So at least here we actually have an error message. So we actually weren't just like in the blind this time. Uh, but okay, so they have a somewhat strict CSP policy, especially the this directive, the connect source directive, which prevented pretty much any connections to domains outside of the, the actual application. But we actually have two options here. So if we could, we could actually bypass the CSP because they were just giving full access to any Google Analytics subdomain. And that's a really easy way to actually bypass CSP. We ended up not choosing that route, but if you are interested in that, you have a lot of different research online on how to bypass CSP using Google Analytics. But we were a bit like worried because we already spent a lot of time on this. So we just wanted to report this and get it out of the way. So we opted for a simpler route. Here we, what we ended up doing was like not as stealthy as the Google Analytics thing that we could have done, but it still worked for a, a POC. And it's also, I think it's uh, something people may not think a lot when they're doing this and it's cool for when there is no CSP bypass at all. So we just conducted a new payload and it's pretty much the same with one little change in the last part, which is instead of doing a fetch to our URL, it actually just sets the document.location to our URL. So like I said, it's not as stealthy because while in the other, just a request happens in the background, in this case, the user is actually redirected to our URL. So the user actually sees something, but in for the purpose of our POC, it was good enough. Uh, I do want to just mention that like the CSP can't prevent something like this. You couldn't just set a, like a more strict CSP to prevent this because what the document.location is doing is pretty much just if you, 
it was pretty much as if you were writing in the URL search bar. So the CSP can really prevent you from just writing another URL and just going there. So we just a success message. We actually got the session ID. Great. We can actually log in as the user. So we have a lot of, well, we just have access to the user account. Okay, so we learned a lot here. Uh, we learned about uh, CSTI. We learned about exploiting like this type of Angular CSTI. We learned about the different types of templating engines and how we could like pinpoint or identify which one was it. Uh, we learned a bit about bypassing filters, about character restrictions, and some ideas that we can apply to some next time that we're dealing with this stuff. And some different ways that we can do account takeover. Maybe, maybe the next time that we're doing this, uh, the password field is actually vulnerable. So we all have to keep all of these things in mind. But, and the bypassing, I, I put bypassing quotes because the way we did it wasn't really a bypass of CSP, but we could have done it. Before some, someone asks in the end, we did try other ways to bypass the CSP. We tried, for example, the pre-flight route. We tried the DNS routes. None of it worked. Um, there was pretty much uh, always being blocked. Uh, but I'd say the most important par parts of fear that we learned by far was the collaboration. Uh, I could have done all of this alone. Like I could have done all of this research by myself, maybe like I said, I would have taken double the time. Maybe by the time I reported it, someone were, would already have reported it. So the importance of actually collaborating with other hackers, it's, it's really, it's really good, especially when you're learning. Like I'm, I'm, I've been doing this for like, I've been in security for three years, but all of this part, this like, uh, web vulnerability research, bug bounties, all of that, that's still quite new to me. I've just, I've been getting into that in like the last year, more or less. So actually learning from other people that are doing this is, is really important. It's much easier than just like bashing your head against the wall until it actually breaks. So yeah. And especially reading others' research. I really, really recommend you all to, I'm not even saying like keep keeping the feeds with a thousand different ways of like thousand different researchers, Twitter and Mastodon and whatever, but just from time to time, just check some places like Partswigger has a lot of really great research on this if you're interested, uh, a lot of Twitter people, but just read some research from time to time. It's really important if you want to actually get into this field. Okay, so for the legal part that I, I mentioned, uh, just a uh, disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I did not, I did not study law ever, um, but I feel like we as researchers don't always think too much about the legal implications of the stuff that we're doing. Like, we just like to hack. Like, is that such a problem? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I really like the hackers movie. I hope other people do as well. Yes, it's cheesy, but it's fun. And I always like the, the parts where the, this character, I, I don't really remember his name now. He was, pretty much just reading the Hacker's Manifesto, which is cringe, but fun as well. But one part of the Hacker's Manifesto that I always like and I always find funny is the part where they say, yes, I am a criminal. My crime is out of curiosity. Well, sure, and of illegitimate access as well. But yeah, let's see what the law has to say about this. Okay. Before that, let's just make a quick distinction about responsible disclosure and bug bounty. What I've been doing uh, in these examples that I've shown before was a mix of the two. One of them had a bug bounty program, the other had just a responsible disclosure form. And they may seem the same, like every bug bounty is a responsible disclosure, but not every responsible disclosure is a bug bounty. While in one, they just pretty much just say, hey, I pinky promise that I won't report you to the police. The other one is actually actively saying, hey, I want you to hack us, come here, find vulnerabilities, we'll give you money, swag, whatever it is. Uh, but what about the cases where the company actually doesn't have a vulnerability, like a responsible disclosure, or they actually don't, they're not in any bug bounty websites or anything like that, and you find something? Well, 
first of all, I'd say don't. <laughs> I'd say don't get into that. Uh, there's a lot of different websites that actually in these types of programs that actually give you the rights to go there and hack at them. So you don't have to do this on websites that don't. But I'm not your parents. You can do whatever you want. And if you do end up finding something in one of these websites, I'd recommend, like, first thing, maybe try to find a security email, like security at company.com or whatever. Maybe try to find a LinkedIn, uh, maybe someone that works in security. If they don't have, like, responsible disclosure or bug money or whatever there is, I doubt they will have a security email, but never hurts to try. Uh, in cases where they don't, you can also try, for example, the HackerOne Disclosure Assistance, which is a service from HackerOne in which they serve a little bit as uh, like middlemen, in which you can just talk to them and they'll try to reach the company if you haven't been able to reach the company as well. As well as bug Open Bug Bounty, but Open Bug Bounty has a little bit more restrictions on what they accept as submissions to their uh, middleman program. Okay, but what does the actual law say about this? Uh, this is focused uh, on Portuguese law, but Portuguese law, like pretty much all other members of the European Union, are based on the Budapest Convention. I'm talking about like cybercrime laws. And the Budapest Convention was a treaty, I think, from 2001. And it laid out a lot of different like guidelines for the different member states to actually implement on their cybercrimes laws to try to make it more uh, unified. And but one of the problems, I'd say one of the biggest problems with this treaty at the time was their Article 2, in which they talked about dishonest intent, and they laid it as something like uh, member states can add this into their law to, so that the actual uh, criminal, so the actual act needs a dishonest intent to be considered a criminal act, but they didn't mention it as something that the member states had to implement. implement. So... From my research, at least, pretty much none of the member states actually implemented this, uh, this, like, uh, necessity of the dishonest intent to their law. So pretty much anything, any type of illegitimate access is considered a, a crime here. Article 6, this is from Portuguese cybercrime law. So Article 6 deals with the illegitimate access and it's just a whole bunch of broad rules and broad generalizations. And that's pretty much coming from Article 2. Article 2, I think, also dealt with the illegitimate access. But these broad rules, and this has been criticized for a long time for a lot, from a lot of different people, this helps no one. Like, the cyber criminals, they don't care if it's illegal. They don't care if it's, like, if they have to have dishonest intent to be considered a crime or not. They, they just want to hack the company, so they'll do it. But us, like, more... Uh, worried with protecting the company can actually be discouraged from actually trying to report things to the company if it's written like this. And pre like almost 20 years later, the UN uh, is doing a new cybercrime treaty. And I think at the time that I'm presenting this, it has already been accepted. And I don't think they dealt with any of the criticisms that people pointed out but they pretty much had the same issue with the intent and dishonest intent and all of that, which they didn't require people to actually implement it still. And apart from that, they also talked about bypassing of security measures in which they could, like, they argue that this was a check for the ethical researchers that they would say, okay, so if we, the company has all of these security measures in it, then... Uh, and the user bypasses all of them, then, okay, then they're probably a black hat. But this security measures bypass could just simply be a, like, geo, uh, geo blocking, like, so if you use a VPN, then you'd be considered a bypassing of a security measure. Some places like the Netherlands and the USA have already stopped, uh, started choosing not to go forward with criminal cases against ethical hackers. So if they see that the researcher acted in good faith, so they found something, reported it to the company, and the company still decided to get them to court, they just choosing to throw it all out, all out, but they're the exception. I just want to end with an excerpt from the EFF in which they talked a lot about, about this treaty, and it goes pretty much in the same way that I was saying, that the... The treaty, the way that it is worded, it just makes it 
harder for good natured people to actually report stuff to the company because they actually just get discouraged. They get afraid that the company might act against them, even though they acted in good faith, while the hackers and the cyber criminals, they don't really care. So why should, why should any of this matter to them? And yeah, that, that was it. I hope everyone liked it. If anyone has any questions, feel free. Any, any questions? Okay, so I, I can start with one. Um, so it's besides when considering the, the vulnerabilities that you found, besides filtering input, what other types of mitigations or mitigating, mitigating measures mm -hmm. would you recommend? Okay, um, well, for example, in the first one, for the self-access, honestly, like, Apart from mitigating inputs, they already did everything right there. They already had everything in place, so they weren't vulnerable to any types of attacks that could escalate the, the vulnerability. So I'd say the first case, they actually did everything right because we couldn't find any way to actually escalate. In the second part, they, they could have done more. So the, the version that they were using of Angular was outdated. Like current versions also just ditched the sandbox, I think. At the time, they were still using, trying to use some sandbox, which pretty much just made the research of life a bit more difficult, but didn't really sanitize or protect against these types of attacks. But in that case, they could have still used, for example, some headers to protect against the cross-site scripting. The, their filter was really naive, so the, the, the recursive eval, that was a really simple bypass that we really did not expect to, to work at all, but it did. Like, we always try that, that never works. We were really excited when we, when we actually got it for the first time here. So yeah, that was still a lot of ways that they could still have, like, I wouldn't say prevent it, like, at all. In this case, the only way to prevent it 100% was really to not accept any types of dangerous inputs from the user, but there was still a lot of ways to actually mitigate the impacts, like not putting your session value actually in the page somewhere you didn't need it. Any, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.